Cheers, Ruby. You've been given a one. I think uh, I would hate to be away from the harbour and away from uh, MD. It's speaking to me about fish because it just brings everything back. that year I was 17 so I was just starting to drive because I remember I was uh, I'd passed my driving test for a gun driving down to Cumberland for the naming ceremony she looked really nice when she came out of the shed got a bit of sunlight on her it was brilliant and you just felt that uh, there was a lot more exciting times to come again fishing operation shooting got the one net up here the code in has dropped from aft I work these for the wheelhouse. The last thing you want to do is get snogged and dragged. That's a simple part of it. After five hours towing, the net is hauled aboard, grabbed using this power block into this point here. A few turns in this capstan. Dog rope, Gelson wire. Click it in, signal, slack back. Wire comes tight, bags slacked. Fish go up forward to the hopper. A guy standing here, maybe a guy standing here, taking your knife, which should be sharp. Up, flick open, collect the guts like that. Well, the longest I've stood here and got it has maybe been 15, 16 hours. A sing song helps pass the time. Had a lot of good times down here. A lot of good times. Twenty-four-year-old Xander West is son of Sandy West and at least the fifth generation of his family to go to the fishing. Their boat, the Steadfast, works out of Fraserburgh, the town at the heart of the crisis facing the UK's whitefish fleet. No, no. See, that's how you doffed up, you know, eh? There we go. Your little dance. When I was little, we used to hear a receiver in the house. You couldn't talk back, but uh, my dad talked every night, 10 o'clock, uh, would sit and we'd be on this receiver and he would tell us how the days and news, which was usually seeing whales, I've seen this, I've seen that, and then it would be good night, love you all, uh, Fiona, Xander, Kenna, Mom, and that would be 10 o'clock every night in it. I think, I think it's, that's missing for life nowadays, is it? That little, like, romantic things, Ken? I would like nothing better than Donnie to be like I was and work with me because I have enjoyed every single minute working with my dad. It is the most dangerous job in Britain, and yet young men are still drawn to the excitement and rewards that lured their fathers and grandfathers to the hunting grounds at sea. You're getting fish, it's very good. Problem is when you do not get fish. <laughs> but the tide has turned. Waters that were once British are now European and the common fisheries policy rules the waves. The fishermen can't stomach it. It's Brussels' job to stop us catching fish, but it's our job to catch fish. If we don't catch fish, we don't get paid. Simple. They have found their industry is regarded by our politicians as having little value as a bargaining chip in Brussels. 
Whilst other nations prize this natural resource, here, since joining Europe, our fishermen believe they are being sacrificed through government apathy. They're fighting for survival. The call to arms was answered by the wives of two Fraserburgh fishermen. On the 5th of November 2002, Carol MacDonald and Moreg Ritchie decided to act. The Cod Crusaders were born. I did basically say to Moreg, you know, I think something should be done about it. And obviously, we're, we're husbands tapped into this, and they'd say, oh, right, and you guys are going to be the ones that's going to do it. They started laughing, and the more they laughed at us, the more determined we got. So the next morning we got up, and that's when we started printing out the petition, and, and that's where we set off from. Within a week, with a 9,000 signature petition, they were at the door of 10 Downing Street. Four weeks later, a rally in Edinburgh carried a staggering 49,000 signatures to the Scottish Parliament. And just days later, they were in Brussels, confronting the European Fisheries Minister, Franz Fischler. Yeah, I will do that. I promise much. you. But trying to save the way of life. Fraserburgh community life. If you remove an industry, especially from the likes of Fraserburgh, it's so highly dependent on the fishing, you're ripping the heart out of the whole community. You're actually taking the heritage and history also away from a community, which is what we're trying to preserve. After the savage decommissioning in 2002, the UK government wants to destroy a further 69 boats. They target the white fish sector, particularly the newer, larger boats like Sandy's Steadfast. The banks, sensing a crisis in their massive investments, are only too willing to seize the chance to get out. Sandy and many other skippers may lose their boats, whether they like it or not. We're just uh, under the, the wheelhouse here, and if you come through, through this way, we go into the mess deck, mess deck gully, like a sort of recreation room as well. The, the whole lot's been refurbished, and it's such a shame, really, isn't it? We get it all broken up. One of the worst aspects of it is looking at this vessel and how well I've kept this vessel, and six and a half year old getting broken up. It is, to me, a criminal act. To watch her come for a keel, to fit your ways, and popping up and doing a combo and to see a finished product, and then a few years later, nearly as I want to get stripped back down to the keels. It's enough to mark you a bit of sick, to tell you the truth. The Scottish executive has set aside £40 million for decommissioning. Generous though this seems, it is estimated that around 80% of the money will go straight to the banks to pay off their loans. Skippers are actually being pushed up against the wall. They've got no choice, they have to take it if the banks are pushing them there. It's the crews that I actually feel sorry for. All they get at the end of the day, if the, if the vessel that they're on is decommissioned, is basically, you know, sorry guys, roll your gear, that's it. They don't even get, you know, as much as a thank you. They won't get a payoff. It's so heartbreaking. Carol's husband, Malcolm, is crewman on a whitefish trawler. Though skeptical of the campaign, He's come to terms with the public profile. I can't really complain. No. I know I get much slagged about it, not at all. On these slags, we don't get a heat, but. <laughs> the real McCoy. God. Green and white, dynamite. But for Malcolm, the days of big cod catches and good prices are a thing of the past. Years ago, maybe you got a buzz, no, no. It's just no fun left in the job. That's been there, uh, 2003, I would say I'd make a boot. If I'm lucky, if I'm lucky, I'd make 18, 19,000, I would say. If I'm lucky. Ten years ago, you'd hundreds, hundreds of boats, right? 
He's marking me. Our money ten years ago, and there's thousands of boxes getting landed. That days is long going. Long going. I like to come in between 5 and 6 a.m. Uh, in order to get my two hours in so I can get home to put my son to school. Two years ago I took it on purely because it was a wee bit of pin money. But I mean, I've become really highly dependent and it pays my bills because my, my husband's taking a drop of wages. The secret is you need to remember exactly where you come from, where your roots are. And I'm just a pretty normal person. I mean, don't get me wrong, I mean, I don't like cleaning up everyone else's, you know, dirt, but, I mean, the money is clean at the end of the week. The money is clean. Um, you don't know what tomorrow brings. April 2003. The Crusaders decide to advance their campaign on a new front. Courted by the SNP, Carol stands for a seat on her local council. Release Fraser Bris potential on the 1st of May. Vote by SNP. You could say vote McDonald all the way. <laughs> Release Fraser Bris potential on the 1st of May. Vote McDonald and you'll be all the way. <laughs> That's a good one. If I'm unsuccessful, I mean, I've nothing to lose. Thanks very much. Because personally, my fight will continue through the Quad Crusaders in order for my community to have some sort of survival rate. Thanks. Ta ta. Oh. Early next morning in Fraserburgh's fish market, there's mixed support for the industry's future. 19 bomb you have to of course it's worth fighting for. Of course it's worth fighting for. I did political it. It's too late. Raising your voice at political level, you know, and standing for what you believe is surely never a pointless exercise, no. At 60 pound a pair of megrams, you on. It's nothing to be politics for me. I just get a living out of it. If it goes doing, it goes doing it. Ladies and gentlemen, the result in Ward 11. <laughs> Carol MacDonald, Scottish National Party. Hiya, honey, click. Right, who you going? 475. Oh, I've lost it. You lost? Aye, 154 votes. I lost it by. Are you alright? I am fine. I am not too disappointed, Ken. The fight will go on through the Code Crusaders. It's as simple as that. Oh, God. Top. Oh, no. Aye. Look, you, even your t shirt now is a clutter. Oh, Finish your sword. Well, hang on and tuck it to me. Undaunted by the defeat, the Crusaders returned to their favoured ground, the media. To really have some faith in the industry, because at the end of the day, we actually have to inject some positivity into this Their greatest strength is their ability to attract press coverage of the crisis. How can I help you? You want a story, are you? Actually, at the point of the transitional age. Bradshaw. Once we advised him about what we... From publicity comes credibility. They gain access to government ministers and contribute to Number 10's report on the industry. All this on a campaign funded by themselves with contributions from the industry and local supporters. Yeah. We've realised that we've got capabilities that we didn't realise we had before. They admitted they're not getting true readings. There's more to life than being a wife and a mother. And Although I was quite happy with that six months ago. So let's put them to, to some use. We've had to sacrifice quite a lot in order to forefront this campaign. I mean, I've got three kids and I've got a grandchild. I mean, Morag's got seven kids. A message from my husband. We're still there when the important times, you know, meal times and bed times. But the quality time with our kids is not the same anymore. July, the decommissioning list is published and Sandy's boat, the Steadfast, is on it. He's unimpressed with the offer, but his bank is pressing him to accept. He has a month to decide. This boat approximately costs 1.35 million. What they're offering uh, in decommission 
is just absolutely ridiculous. It's a mere pittance. I would come out of this with nothing if I decommissioned my boat. His bank will take all of the money plus the value of his fish quota. Tougher still, the deal even requires him to price the breaking up of his own boat. Within days, two Danish shipbreaking yards are in town hunting for business. Even if it's 21 or 22 ton. They aim to profit by selling on all reusable parts. It's a 5,000. Yeah. Aye. It is. So Definitely. you're happy with that then? Absolutely. 69 boats are to be scrapped. And uh, we hope to get 30 or 35 boats. We don't want too many because we also have to sell the equipment. So we're only going for the best. You had a 3508, huh? 35 Main 1. engine. 3512. A 3512. Some of the skippers uh, get mad. Almost tell us to fog off the boat, so to speak, because uh, it's a really tension time and they cannot make up their mind about the decommissioning. And then there was... The, the, the gyro compass. Okay. You've got that one as well? Yeah. Good. Okay. And I got everything. Fine. I needed to know. My hopes for the future, I think, the same as most fishermen, is that <laughs> we can go on. Keep doing what the family has done for years. That's catch fish. The West family has built each boat mindful of the next generation. The crew of the fourth Steadfast are Sandy's two sons, a nephew, as well as a cook loyal to the boat for 21 years. Sandy stays ashore to weigh up the future. For years, his boys have been looking forward to taking over the family business. There's a fierce sense of pride every time you take a boat out of harbour. And probably even more so when your dad's watching you do it. It's strange. Say, uh, possibly, could be the last trip of the boat. We don't know. It's very sad to see. For every man at sea, there are at least five or six people ashore working in the support industries. Going out the door here. The rest of Europe is building new super trawlers, and we're being demised deliberately. There must be a hidden agenda for the Scottish fleet. They want this out, and the only way they want this out is because you're one of the richest fishing grounds there is. We could become the first island in the history of the world that doesn't even have a fishing industry. It's not because of conservation, it's about accommodation of the Spanish and the European fleet. We're being sacrificed on the altar of Euro Union. Around the harbour here, it's uh, basically all little industries. There's no big ones at all. There's the electrical engineers, which is us. Painter, plumber, the hydraulic man. Can't remember the ball, but there's loads. This year alone, again, we reckon four, maybe 500 jobs ashore will be lost by this decommissioning. There's got to be a point that things is going to collapse. Their fears are based on previous decommissioning rounds, when they received no compensation and losses ran into hundreds of thousands of pounds. has been a shoe shop for 20 years. Nobody has confidence in the fishing. Nobody has confidence in the town. The new company just doesn't have the confidence to sign a long-term lease. Just nobody seems to have the get up and go. Well, they do. Actually, they do. The cod casinos are doing quite a good job. Your heart and soul goes into the shop. It becomes you and you become it. And it's gone.
not every sector of the industry is in decline. The most successful boats fish only for the pelagic species herring and mackerel. The pelagic sector is an example of the global potential of UK fishing. Their seasonal catches can end up in sushi bars in Tokyo or on the dinner tables of Moscow. It's midsummer and Forever Grateful is hunting for herring off Cape Roth. As well as keeping an eye on the sonars, the modern technology are always looking on the surface to see if there's a whale blowing or, or uh, the garnets fishing. The Scottish Pelagic fleet consists of only 30 vessels. With crews earning two to three times the income of their whitefish colleagues, jobs are like gold dust. On the Forever Grateful, it's a family affair. Up on the bridge is Father Will White, his son-in-law, and Will Jr. Is that a mark here? That's just a mark now. It's a mark of fish. A, mark of fish. Here, look. a very sharp mark. Look. <laughs> Over technology work. Come away, me lucky lads. Let's be having it. That's a bit of it. Though the fleet may be small, the investment is huge. Watch it. To build and license a boat like this today would cost over 20 million pounds. It's not always been good times. The present fleet has evolved out of its own crisis. By the late 70s, herring stocks had plummeted and a five-year fishing ban was imposed. But 20, 25 years ago, they closed the North Sea for herring, and we thought it was the end of the world. The whitefish sector was doing well at the time, and we thought the end of the world. But along came the mackerel, and the mackerels pulled us, like the pelagic fleet, out of the bayer. Back in those days, fishing was seasonal, and boats alternated between whitefish and herring. But as fishing techniques evolved, the pelagic boats have become highly specialised. The scale of the catch will seem awesome to many. However, it should be remembered that in 2003, the catching power of the fleet, compared to stock levels of herring, was considered to be well balanced. The scientists even recommended a major increase in quota for the North Sea. <laughs> That's the best bit. <laughs> the pressure's off a wee bit. The forever grateful can carry over 600 tons of herring. Well, let's just start at the pump and we've got, uh, I would think, a good 100 ton, at least in the bag. I am redeemed. I am redeemed. Jesus loose the chains of sin and set me free. Jesus looks the chains of sin and set me free. This is a no, a female. Brilliant. Did you like some? <laughs> At the present moment, the future is rosy, but it we live in so fickle a situation. This year, 2003, they've increased the herring quota by 40 per cent. Maybe next year, with the stroke of a pain, they'll decrease it by maybe 30 or maybe 50 per cent. 
That's good. Listen to our buddies and keep us all up for cheese. Yeah, man. Right. What are you testing? Yet even in the most successful sector of Scottish fishing, there are real fears for the future as the European Union continues to grow. The Spaniards will always beat the buck, or the foreign fleet will always beat the buck. Another ten countries coming in. Are we opening the door for any Tom, Dick or Harry to come in and benefit from our own grounds? The fishing communities, especially in the northeast, have been built up in fish, and we are going to be decimated by politicians that does not bother their backside about anything. The final decision has been made. The bank has forced Sandy to decommission the steadfast. I never think this would happen. Never. You just never think that would happen. A new boat, just six and three quarters a year old, would end up going to Breckers Yard. You just can hardly believe that. I mean, this is his last sail with the boat. I mean, it's it's quite sad, really, and it is. It's a totally different feeling him going away with the boat the night as fit it usually is. I don't think my dad's the kind of person to show much emotion outside. And probably I am, am neither, so... It'll be interesting to see how it pans out between the two of us over the next two days. My dad, to me, has been my skipper, my teacher, my dad, and probably one of my best pals. So much to thank him for that I couldn't probably, I wouldn't have his face, because I don't think he'd like me to it, but I've never ever regretted going to sea. I'll see you later. With this decommissioning, there's a lot of good men been put at work. I mean, really experienced guys like my dad. I mean, to me, he's a brilliant fisherman. I think a lot of guys in Fraserburgh would agree with that. And he's been stolen out of the industry, which is a great shame, because uh, I think he's a lot of knowledge to pass down to younger guys. Hey, I'll give you a phone, right? When I go in, all right? I love you, all right? Be good. See you later. Every time they leave a harbour, there's always that fear and there's always that dread. You know, are they going to return home safely to us? You've always got that in the back of your mind. It's the way of our life. Mm. It's just something that, 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 that's there. You know they're out there. You know they'll do whatever they can to make themselves safe. And you, you try not to worry too much about it. If you were to sit and worry about every storm that we personally see in the northeast of Scotland, then you'd be for, you'd be a nervous wreck. It's hard to hard to keep your feet. It's the boat rolling and things. It's quite difficult. It is getting here, struggling. <laughs> <laughs> It's day one on the Steadfast's voyage to Denmark. Weather permitting, the trip should take 51 hours. Hello, Sandy. On board to help is Sandy's son-in-law, right. Keith. Back a seven. Aye. Like a day, is it? Well, it's never bad, like, sorry, it? aye. Oh, it's it's good. good. With the imminent loss of the Steadfast from the family, Xander has decided to quit fishing. However, the lure of the sea is just too strong. This is uh, Forty's oil field. Uh, this is what I'm going to be doing uh, after we get uh, clear with this boat. I'm going to be in one of these uh, standby vessels, waiting to respond to emergencies that could happen. Uh, also, uh, chase fishing boats away. Uh, just hoping that the standby job is going to provide me with the same excitement, which I, I hope it will.
The core of the crisis in the whitefish sector centres on how many fish are in the sea. The politicians listen to the scientists. The fishermen fiercely dispute their figures. Hunter against conservationist, daily experience versus an inexact science. Before joining Europe, fishermen lived in the much simpler market of supply and demand. With the advent of the common fisheries policy in the early 70s, there came the wonder world of guaranteed minimum prices for your fish and grants to build boats. As overfishing became rife and fears grew for stock levels, the tide turned. The good times were over. Today, each boat belongs to an association that is given a total allowable catch for the year. If too much is caught too early, the year's end brings slim pickings. I'll just show you something here. This is my quota that I got from a producer organization the, big, the, the end of last month. Now, I've got cod here at eight boxes, haddock here at 17 boxes, and I've got whitens here at 17 boxes. If you're lucky, that would net you about coming up away 1,600 pounds for your month. Uh, that's just utterly ridiculous. You could catch that in one haul, no problem. If, if we were not dec decommissioning this boat, I'd be faced with landing blackfish every trip. With quotas down 70% in the last decade, anyone catching beyond their quota is faced with a stark choice. To be legal, they must either dump the excess at sea, anathema to a hunter, or earn less by having to pay to rent quota from another skipper. Their other choice is to run the gauntlet of the fisheries officers and land blackfish. The conspiratorial nature of landing blackfish was initially seen as exciting, but many skippers now admit to feeling criminalized, yet continue to do it as fish prices and their incomes drop. We haven't landed blackfish this year at all. Just once, once there wasn't a lot. We've been having to rent more fish, but now there's hardly any fish to rent. So th th there's no way, way forward for me this year anyhow. But uh, this just makes me feel like a cr criminal. The fishery officers is just waiting for you whenever you come in. We've been made to lie. We've been made to cheat. They've put us in this position. In order to earn a living or to be greedy? Oh, certainly not greedy, no. The media attention that the Crusaders have generated has had an unexpected twist. They've been nominated for the Great Scott Awards in Glasgow. Some of them coming in with their ball gowns and you think, oh my God, are we get a fit in? Cool! Autographs. Behave yourself. I kind of fit my fog portion. Are you nervous? Mm -hmm. Was it a crusade for God's sake? Crusade for God's sake. Look at us, gonna what do to a social evening, right? <laughs> and we've got all this cord crusading stuff. This is what we're going to shove underneath my politicians' noses. In the words of Shania Twain, let's go, girls. <laughs> I think we're supposed to be in here, we're one of the ten finalists. Sorry? I think we're supposed to be in here, one of the ten finalists. All oh, right. Ten finalists? <laughs> well, nobody said ten finalists are in, but Though they missed the top award, the Crusaders have won priceless publicity. I thought it was great. 
Really thought it was great, they're getting recognised at last for the efforts. And I was invited as well, so I didn't get to the high profile thing, so I was pretty sick about that. She's uh, surprised me in a lot of ways, like, a lot of ways. She's got some bottle. When I was about 12, 13 years old, my father was a big influence. He, he learned my lot at that early age. He used to put me in the forward part of the boat and I used to catch my own fish, pulling up a cod bigger than myself from 30, 40 fathoms. It was quite exciting, I could tell you. I would say that intrigued me to go out the fishing at the early stage. I was never going to tell him about the decommissioning because he, he hadn't very long to live at that time, so I wasn't going to tell him, but when he asked what I was doing, I just had to tell him. The last week of my father's life, he, he was just sort of lying his pillow side on and he, he wouldn't have really lift his head, you know, he just like lay there and uninterested and all of a sudden when I mention decommissioning and especially scrapping the boat, he's, his head turns up and he just looks at my face with great wide open eyes, you know, staring up. His mouth was wide open. It was, it was amazing because he hadn't done that actually for a whole week. So it must have hurt them a lot. Quite a lot, I think. The heritage, well, I days are long gone. Okay. Boys falling on for their fathers now, but. A lot of boys are just realising it's a shit job. Skippers are seeing that the job's knackered again. So they're sailing up their boats and putting their loons into something else. It's not a job, it's an existence. I didn't enjoy it now. Once upon a time I would have enjoyed it, but I just every week's a thought. The bigger thought is, that is going to see then coming back and going into the office to get your pay. To see if you've knocked your pan in for. And going up the road and seeing her face, my face, it's just soul destroying, especially lately. Cod procedures started off as sparklers, ended up being rockets, but they didn't have put a bang up the industry. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first anniversary of the Cod Crusaders. Cod children. <laughs> it's Roddy. No, it's okay. There's no escape from the pressure as they organise their visit to the European Fisheries Summit in Brussels. Keep the faith. Isn't that good? It's good. But for Carol, there are more immediate problems closer to home. See you later. Bye. Seeing the same woman I married a year, like 13 years ago. She's not so reliant on me now. It's never off the phone, she's never in. She's fighting for a fishing, but nobody's subsidising her. I'm here to subsidise it with money that I had not got. She sees light in the tunnel, I'll let her be. She can see it. She'll maybe see it herself. I don't care. From 8 o'clock in the morning till pff, 7 o'clock at night, this phone starts ringing. I would do on these heathen. I'm £600 every quarter for a phone bill. I want to see for 10 days, 20 days, and you come home, you, you want a bit of peace. I'm back at either way. Just take time for our family as well. OK, fair enough, I've had my ups and downs with the family, but I think we, we, we've got our shells now onto an even keel that I'm just so hell-bent. Again, this is where the <clears throat> selfishness comes in. I'm just so hell-bent in achieving more than what we've achieved. I think that's maybe a wee bit greedy, but... Um, 
I'm not, I'm not satisfied just yet. I'm not going to want to throw away my family life because, I mean, they'll, they'll always be there for me. Or I hope. <laughs> um, for the Cod Crusaders, maybe when I be. I don't think it would ever come to divorce. Like it just, It's just getting over this hurdle at the moment to see if... Just to step back, here, look, that's fine, that's what's happening here. I'll try and sort that bit here. Then still get on with our code crusading. That's great. Okay. But as long as there's time here for us, that's all I'm asking. Not much, not a lot. Just enough for the Bairns especially. Right. It's my turn to... Shaka pan. Chicken breast wrapped in bacon and a cheese food slice. I think our smuggle tricks that Jamie Oliver can teach me. With the Danish coast just over the horizon, it's the last evening on the Steadfast. They always uh, say that boats are girls. She's a great boat. She's coming on well. Her engine's in. And it was absolutely fabulous. It was, Something that has memories that I'll always have in the back of my head and I enjoyed every single minute of watching her take shape. It was mine. Well, not mine, but my family's and partly mine. And I think you always put a little bit of self into your boat. This boat really tells a lot about us. It tells a story and that story is a way to be scrapped. Really, this boat has become a part of me, in a sense. It's, it's been a big part of my life. Uh, so, tomorrow, that's where it'll surround, not in the investment, not in the money. Not so much as the end of a dream, it's the end of a part of my life. It's the end of a big part of my life. We'll just have to get over it. It's December 2003 in Brussels, the time of year when the European fisheries ministers come together to haggle over their individual fishing rights. This is the moment when the negotiating skills of each nation are brought to the table. Carol and Morag are in town for the second year, hoping to make their mark. Last year, we were naive, we were just learning the system. And I just said to Morag, would you have thought that this time last year, that we would be thinking, well, maybe next year we'll, we'll be in Brussels on the negotiation team? And she says, no. Also in town are delegates from other fishing groups. From the Scottish Fishermen's Federation, Davy Milne brings added emotion as, during the very week of the talks, his boat is also in Denmark, waiting to be destroyed. Still end up with 20 odd days. 21 days. 21, was it 21.6? The delegates share a sense of frustration and impotence as the future of their industry is bargained for by ministers behind closed doors. Well, that's just the position we're fishing industry is in. You rely on your representation. And if your representation is not strong, then we're not strong. I have to hope Mr Bradshaw is very good. Remember that for Annex 17, we've had 15 days. The key role for delegates is trying to advise and influence their ministers during a break in the talks. Carol and Morag are invited to a briefing session with UK Fisheries Minister Ben Bradshaw the man who must deliver for Britain. Are we being a bit complacent on this, and assuming you can get it, or is, uh, how confident are you? I wouldn't that? assume we can get anything. I wouldn't assume we can get anything until we've got it. How's the decommissioning going to actually sort of work, and how are we going to explain it? And there are pluses and minuses of any particular length. Our ministers are very, very weak men. And they're either weak or they just don't want to do anything about it. Rather than shorter periods. I'm going to have to go. They don't have the emotion that these fishermen feel. Thank you. See you later. They can't possibly feel 
the emotion and the heartbreak that's actually felt within these communities. It's a graveyard. It's a dump, isn't it? It's very eerie. It's very strange. Strange feeling. Time of morning as well. I, I swear with Mr. Fischler and the European Commission and, and we're on the uh, fisheries ministers think of Fresbra and, uh, and Peter Head in Aberdeen. That pile of rubbish, that's what they think of us. Well, I think that's what we think of them. Even as the boat ties up, there are bargain hunters waiting to pounce. First aboard, an Icelandic fisherman. Oh, I'm looking for an engine. I keep on oh, you're looking for an engine? Yeah. Uh, okay, but I can... Would this engine maybe be good for that boat? Oh, it's, a, it's a similar size of boat. Yeah, your size. Yeah. This is a good engine. Yeah. Uh, it's a good engine. I'm just glad I, I'm not going to be here to see it cut up. Yeah. I'm glad yeah, I am yeah, not yeah. going to be here to see yeah. it okay, cut can, in I pieces. Can, I can understand. Hello. Next, two Dutchmen in search of electronics. Vultures flying above you. Yeah. Waiting to pick it as scraps. I sure did. Maybe a bit interesting that reader. They'll sell things in, in their time. Oh, it's fearsome. Aye, oh aye. Just in their time at all. I hope he does take the radar because it's buggered. As the talks drag on, frustrated delegates meet and share their grievances. To be quite honest, I think what we're going to see is a delivery package has been devised a few weeks ago and what we're actually witnessing is just the fine tuning of it. Behaved in a, a dictatorial fashion and we'll A week today is Christmas and where are we? We are actually sitting like the rest of the other idiots waiting just to be the first ones told that's the deal done, this is what you're getting. It is the last night of the Brussels talks the pressure builds for a final agreement. Weary, after days of negotiation, the ministers talk through the night. Just after dawn, word comes out that they have reached a compromise. But the word is not good. It's the same thing again. It looks as though we are going to come out with the worst deal again for being the most conservative in the EU. Bringing substance to the rumours, Ben Bradshaw arrives to reveal his deal. I think it's a good deal for the UK. I'll say a bit more about it later. Thanks. With him is Ross Finney, Scottish Fisheries Minister. We've got a long-term cod recovery plan for the first time in the European Union, which I believe will allow cod to recover. It won't happen overnight, but it will happen year on year. And at the same time, we have maximised our fishing opportunities on those stocks that are doing well. So those communities that depend on fishing for a livelihood will be able to survive and earn enough money to keep going to take advantage of the cod when it does recover. That is simply unworkable, because you're going to lose a huge increase in our quota, but 25% 
percent of that project clearly can be taken in the major area for catching fish. We came away with uh, almost everything that was on our priority list, and I don't think there's any other country that could tell you honestly that they did that. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. I'm a fisherman. I've spent 30 years to see. There are no cod in that area. I think it's a better balanced uh, uh, outcome. There's no way the fishermen will survive in this. It's impossible. Like... But I think the really positive aspect is that we've taken forward some of the ideas which the industry themselves were promoting. This cool question of getting a more spatial distribution. Say we're working in Charlie. Say we're working at Tivina Power or whatever, right? We have to come on here. We have to steam 120 miles, 130 miles to get a permit to go back out to, sh to shift two miles. Who the fuck drive to that thing? Like I just did again. There are prospects of building on this and therefore seeing a progressive improvement in the lot of our fishermen. The French seem to get to go into talks and they tell them what they want. Our minister seemed to lie back. To them, this is a major achievement, the way Mr Bradshaw's body language was today. Well, I'd certainly rather be doing something else than the week before Christmas spending 24 hours all night negotiating in Brussels. Is this ridiculous, Ashley? To be quite honest, I'm in a, a state of disbelief because we've actually seen now how things is conducted within the Commission. There's no point in getting, you know, a big quota uh, when you've got no days to go and catch it. We're being shafted. Back in Denmark, Sandy and Zander must finally leave the Steadfast. I could stop the men and jump from here. It's just that button. It's only there. Yeah, look, I'll show you. You'll, you'll see it. You just keep it pressed. I'll leave it as it is, and you just press yeah. that button, and... We take care of it. OK, that's fine. Good. Bye bye. Okay, bye. That's it, dude. That's something the kind of the kind of Tagawa the knowledge you've got. It's something I'll never ever forget. Since I played a hut. Taking out a Peter Head for the first time. They kind of decommission that. They kind of decommission and take away memories. It's not right. They left her just as they had lived in her. Disillusioned by Brussels, the Cod Crusaders have decided that their future now lies in campaigning to take the British fleet out of the common fisheries policy. To be quite honest, I do think that that day will come and I just hope that we're still here to witness it. If national control, or should I say when we get national control, I would say it's, it, it's quite a lot of perseverance through ourselves that maybe it's going to achieve it. It's no longer a dream, it is, it is going to become reality. And you'll be there? I'll be there. We'll <laughs> <laughs> be there to fly the flag the day it happens, yep. definitely. She's put us much work, blood and sweat and all. There's just no way that I would take that away from her. It's all got her life, it's been fighting for a few years yet. So I've just about with it. There's just no way I'd take a ticket to off here. No way, I couldn't live with myself. But I all liked it or no.
Back in Denmark, there's an incredible sting in the tale of the steadfast. Even though Brussels demands that her hull be destroyed, other parts can be sold off. Her wheelhouse, engine and electronics have been sold, almost unbelievably, to fishermen from Thailand. They'll ship each bit home and reassemble it on another hull. They wanted to buy the complete vessel and just cannot understand the waste of a good ship in perfect condition. Very sad thing you know, to be the either owner or the skipper with, I mean, the, their life is on the vessel and to see the vessel torn apart like this is, I think, we cannot describe how, how sad it is. I've been home, I mean, every night nearly I go to my bed, I'm thinking about fish. I remember my father saying something about fish fever, so I think that's maybe what it's like. Let's go a while now, do my month at a standby. <laughs> to the best of my ability, get paid for it and then come back to this guy. And someday I'll be able to pass on a story to him. I said earlier on I wouldn't go back, but if it's in my blood, I'll maybe just go back. If something good had come out of it, we'd be able to turn around and say, well, at least it was for something, but it hasn't. It's been in vain because absolutely nothing good has come out of it. The fishing isn't in a better state. The fishermen haven't they got in a better deal because our boat's been scrapped. You just feel shafted, really, and that's just where it comes to now. In the last four years, Scotland's whitefish fleet has been decimated. The fishermen believe their livelihood is being sacrificed through political neglect and fear theirs will be another UK industry consigned to museum and memory. I mean, if you get a big haul of cod aboard, I mean, it's, it's tremendously exciting. I, I mean, I've just seen myself just jo jumping into the fish hopper when there's cod there, and just jumping in and getting in there and kissing them and hugging them, just really excited. I mean, the crew says, look at him. Can I mean, it, it, if you get a haul of cod, it's a lot of money, right enough, but it's not the money you think at the time. It's just a, it's just a fish, they're just a beautiful fish. Just... It's a simple question, do you want me back, yes or no? You know I do. What would you like to do?